First, I'd like to introduce our special guest, Masha Gessen. Masha, welcome. Uh, for those of you that are, don't know, Masha is a Russian-American journalist, author, and activist. They're writing on autocracy, LGBTQ+, and culture in Russia and the United States has earned numerous awards, including a National Book Award. Born in Moscow, Masha moved to the United States as a teenager. In the early 90s, they moved back to Russia on assignment as a young journalist. Eileen was a young journalist in Moscow as well, uh, as you probably all know. Today, Masha is a staff writer at The New Yorker, a distinguished writer in residence at Bard College, and the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship to name just a few of the things that keep them busy. Their latest book is Surviving Autocracy. It draws from their childhood in the Soviet Union and two decades of reporting on the resurgence of totalitarianism in Russia. And it also reflects on the erosion of democratic institutions and cultural norms, both in Russia and here in the United States. Masha has long been a brave and outspoken critic of Vladimir Putin, even before Russia's unjust invasion of Ukraine created a new significant humanitarian crisis in that region and around the world. Voices like Masha's are needed now more than ever, and so I will introduce Masha and Eileen to have their conversation with each other. Welcome. That conflict, there's a lot of dis different discussions in the United States about how to think about it. Um, well, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have 30 minutes, but okay. I have a few other questions. All right, all right, let me, let me. Um, so I think there's some, uh, there's some assumptions that we have made throughout the, this conflict that I think we need to question. Uh, one assumption or one sort of common uh, trope is that the United States is helping Ukraine to an extent that, you know, to, 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 to an extraordinary extent, et cetera. Um, and while there's truth to that, right, there's truth to the idea that there's Western consensus and that this Western consensus has been surprisingly stable, the fact is, if the United States were really helping Ukraine to the extent possible and necessary, this war would be over, right? The US has the military power and the financial power and the political power to end this conflict, right? um, Which is where we come to the second assumption, which is that um, the US has to step very carefully the West in general has to step very carefully to prevent World War III, or to prevent escalation. And there are two corrections I want to make to that. Uh, you know, I don't want to dismiss that concern out of hand, but I, I want to make two corrections to it. One is that um, Russia thinks it's fighting World War III. Russia thinks it's fighting a war against the United States and Ukraine as a proxy. So, we have to question how meaningful this idea of not escalating or not directly getting the US into conflict is. And the other, and I think this is a more important thing to think about, is you know, that idea um, that, uh, that we, can't, uh, we can't escalate or we can't get the US involved can also be translated as it's okay as long as Ukrainians die, but we don't risk Western European lives, we don't risk US lives, right? But certainly, I mean, you're much more likely to hear this in Europe, but there are a lot of people in Europe who understand that, um, that Europe is trying to buy its own safety and security, uh, and the price is Ukrainian lives. So how do you, I mean, in, we now see, though, in the United States, Republicans questioning the support. We also, though, you know, Putin says it is this existential threat. Do, does, do other countries see it that way? Because we've also had countries like India and others sitting on the fence. And I wanted to ask you, why, what is it that the United States has been doing that has, in fact, or not doing, actually, more specifically, over the last decade, two decades, three decades, that has, in fact, um, inspired or caused these countries, particularly the non-aligned movement, to be actually you know, sitting on the fence and or kind of adopting the Russian line. Right. Oh, I think there are a number of factors, um, but I think, you know, the, the sort of what I want you to imagine for a second is what this war looks like from Putin's point of view, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
I think he he has come to believe to a great extent, and 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 there are reasons why he can believe this, that he's really representing most of the world against a small part of the world, which is the West, which is trying to establish its hegemony over the rest of the world. And you know, he feels or he positions himself as the only leader who has the courage of his convictions to actually go to war to protect traditional values, um, and that he has you know, India, the entire African continent, m much of Latin America, all of Arab countries on his side, right? And he's fighting the war, this war on behalf of that entire big world. Um, and while that may seem to us a crazy perspective, it's really worth contemplating, right? And it's really worth contemplating why, for example, Russian propaganda has so much traction. Mm -hmm in African countries, um, in India, in Latin America. Um, you know, it's because of the experience of US intervention, because of the experience of US imperialism, because rhetoric such as, you know, we're fighting US imperialism, which is encroaching on our own um, imaginary borders, right, which is the case in Ukraine. Um, that gets a lot of traction. People have lived experience of US imperialism uh, and, and lived experience of sort of indifference and ignorance, where where Russia is actually trying to show um, more understanding and find more common ground. You've recently written too about tendencies in the United States, not autocratic tendencies, and I, you just used the word traditional values. Right. Uh, what what is that traditional values code for? Because uh, I find that when I listen to Putin speeches and. Um, and, and also then you see that, and describe how that do you think is translating into the United States? And what is at its core of, about traditional values, LBG2, sorry, LGBTQI and also, um, you know, BIPOC uh, and woke, this word woke. Um, you see this conversation all the time, but what is at its core, do you think? And how dangerous is it if that takes hold here? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so you know, there um, there are all these camps of people who um, who do work, who do activism, and, and and do investigative work around this sort of worldwide traditional values movement, and they roughly fall into two camps. One that is convinced that the Russians are really funding it and driving it throughout the world, and one that is convinced that US evangelists, uh, especially once they started feeling like they're marginalized here um, around 2008, 2010, started looking for other places in the world where they would have more of an audience. And uh, when, I, when I was reporting my book, The Future is History, I went to this gathering called the World Congress of Families, mm -hmm. um, which is a big, International, it's what it sounds like. It's a traditional values gathering. And, um, and I was really trying to figure out, you know, is it the Russians or is it the Americans, right? And what I saw was that it's a true meeting of the minds. Um, there's, um, there were people there from all, all over the world, but there were American activists who've been in that field for, with Russians mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. There are Russians who've been in it for decades, and new Russians, and a lot of new Russian money, and that certainly has been significant, especially before the war. Um, but, but really, they, these are people who are brought together by common anxieties and common nostalgia and a common sense that they are being displaced. There's, there's a hu uh, there, there are a couple of things that p play a huge role. One is demographic panic, mm -hmm. right? So that's... <clears throat> um, and demographic panic exists in India, it exists in Russia, it exists in the entire post-Soviet space, and it exists here. Here, it, it has a clearly racist undertone. Uh, in Russia, too, but in Russia, it's also sort of the, the, uh, the, the eternal imperial anxiety that colonized people will take over, right? Um, because they have higher, higher birth rates. Um, and, and, and so on. So demographic panic, you know, we're being displaced. <clears throat> the other is the rate of social change. And that's where LGBTQ issues meet demographic panic, right? Um, and what this really, you know, overall, this is all past-oriented politics. Mm 
And the reason it's so effective and the reason that the meeting of the minds happens is because there's so many people so anxious about the future, right? Um, and they're not being offered a vision of the future that can take them with, it, with them, but, um, but they're being offered a vision of the past. It's an imaginary past. Traditional values is a super vague concept, right? It means different things in different countries, but what it communicates is we're going to take you back to a time when you didn't feel this overwhelming anxiety, this, this sense of displacement. We're going to take you back to a place where things that make you so uncomfortable now, such as LGBTQ people, just don't exist. Do you think, though, that there's also economics fu funding driving this? Because it's not, it, not necessarily just displacement of, of religion, but also that it's interesting because the interests of many voters for, for, for Donald Trump actually have the economic interests that the Democrats actually advance, I mean, for workers' rights, for, for other things. And it's, I think that's what's actually also causing disruption in the, in the, in the Republican Party. So what, what is at its core, even with other countries, the non-aligned movement, how do you see economic disparities, economic inequality um, in, in all of this? You know, I think that the mistake that we often make is to think about these economic issues in very linear ways, right? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 sort of, it's sort of the next stage of the rational choice fallacy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people can have economic anxiety that's not directly related to their objective well-being, right? Well, like, we know this, but we don't know... We don't we don't think about it when we think when we talk about why people, for example, vote for for Donald Trump, right? So often people seem stumped by, oh well, you know, uh, wealthier white people are actually voting for for Donald Trump, so it can't be economic anxiety. Of course, it it can be economic anxiety. That's exactly you know people who have more to lose are more likely to feel more anxiety, and so. Right. Um, you, you know, so uh, that's not directly answering the question about work, workers' rights, but I'm just saying, you know, let's think about economics not in terms of dollar figures, but in terms of feelings, right? And in, in, yeah. in, in terms of how, how anxious people feel. Um, and I think, you know, for sort of direct economic interests, uh, Democrats have a huge communications problem, right? Uh, uh, Donald Trump and people like him are much more effective at communicating that they hear the anxiety, um, that they understand the fear, that they will do something about it. Whereas Democrats, you often get the sense that they just expect you to count the money in your wallet and make rational decisions based on that. And that's not how politics works. <laughs> so let's talk about the truth wars. I mean, I was in Russia in 2004 at, at actually a tea with uh, Putin right after the Beslan school attack. Wow. And he spoke <clears throat> for three hours. And, um, and at the time, he talked about terrorism and Basayev and uh, you know, had the United States meeting with him. And, why, and Osama bin Laden was still loose. But one of the things he said at the time, when I asked him why he was cracking down on independent media, he said, there is no independent media. Whoever owns the media owns the truth. And there is no truth. And that yeah. should have been the lead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What has happened to truth and the rule of law and so much at our, the core of our democracies and the core of, really, I think, of the ability for people to be free? Um, well, I mean, that idea, that, that's a huge question. Right? That's yeah, a bunch is. of questions. <laughs> uh, so let me, let me, let me take the, 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 the Putin and truth part of it because I think it's, uh, it, it, can, it, it, it can help us... Um, <laughs> move this conversation so you know it's it's so telling right and we we don't we often don't listen to these autocratic leaders or to other other leaders when they tell us exactly what they mean right the core of totalitarian propaganda propaganda uh and this is actually interesting because it's also the core of trumpian propaganda and the core of trumpian lies is not to convince you that something that's not the case is the case it's to convince you that nothing is true, right? It's the very old Arendtian saying, you know, every, uh, nothing is true and anything, everything is possible, mm -hmm. right? Um, that in a, in a totalitarian state, it then has the consequences of basically nothing being known and knowable unless the leader or the regime tells you exactly what to think and to say, right? You don't know what things are until you turn on the television and they tell you. 
because observable reality or you know, stating observable reality can get you in trouble, can land you in prison. Um, but, but the baseline of that, the, you know, the, the, the foundation on which that, that's built is there's no truth. Right? And I think you know, we really need to pay attention to that when, uh, when we're dealing with Donald Trump, you know, uh, now his, we're going to be dealing with so much more of him um, with, uh, with, the, with the presidential race, right? Fact-checking doesn't work against that. Right? Checking his lies or counting his lies doesn't work against that. Um, finding ways to assert the value of truth as such, that's what works against that. So one of the other things I wanted to ask you is there's this big assumption um, I, I see it in the Western media with pundits on TV, and, I, and I'm getting a much different viewpoint from Russian friends who were at the forefront of the democracy movement in right. the 80s and the early 90s when I was there. And, and they are now very pro-Putin. And, um, and it's shocking. And I think there's this perception in the United States that you know, if people were, f were free to speak their minds in Russia, there would be this huge uprising, just like we saw with Glasnost and Perestroika, and, and that Putin would be overthrown and we would have a democratic Russia again. And I, even at the time when I was covering the sort of fall of communism, I always tried to point out that our revolution was, a, it was still a little top down, but it was much more of an organic thing. And from the bottom up, the words, we the people, allow the government only so much power is completely different from Mikhail Gorbachev saying, right. you're now allowed to speak. You're now allowed to restructure. So is there a misperception in the United States about, about what happens, what can possibly happen to Putin? And what happens after Putin? Um, yeah, I think there are a bunch of misperceptions. <laughs> there are a bunch of questions. <laughs> uh, no, there are a bunch of misperceptions. So. Um, so one is, you know, I think I think there's this very well-intentioned idea that it's not this is Putin's war, and not Russia's war. Um, there's actually a terrific book that's either just come out or is about to come out by Jade McLean, uh, who is a British um, scholar who did, I think, a dozen years of research on Russian public opinion. It's really in-depth, and uh, it's a short book, but it's um, um, but it's it's just so smart, and it's called Russia's War. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what, uh, what, 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 what the headline says, right? Um, and it's not that she's claiming that, uh, that Russians overwhelmingly support the war, right? Mm -hmm. It's that she really sort of takes a deep dive into people's core beliefs, but also uh, into the nature of totality, you know, of, of totalitarian society where you can't meaningfully talk about public opinion when there's no public and there's no opinion, right? And again, to cite Arendt, what she wrote uh, about the difference between totalitarianism and sort of your garden variety tyranny is that tyranny demands certain behaviors, certain statements, um, but totalitarianism deprives people of the very ability to form opinions, right? So. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that that's true of that heady time that we both remember so well and with such, um, with such affection, right, of the late 80s and early 90s, when it really felt like it was a country that was reinventing itself. I think so many of the people who are now Putin supporters who seem to be pro-democracy are those people who are extremely sensitive to, to signals from above. Mm. Uh, and... <clears throat> You know, and it will follow a strong leader, and probably did did some great work and some great writing, but in the end, right? These are just people who, you know, they're totalitarian subjects, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's part of what we need to understand about Russia. Um, the other part, and this, you know, this has huge consequences. It's not just how do we think about Russia; it's also how do we make policy, right? Uh, we continue to base sanctions on these. Uh, I think really insane ideas about how if there's enough economic pressure on ordinary people, ordinary people are going to rise up. Yeah, right, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're getting, you're seeing people going to jail for 10 years for a Facebook post. They're going to rise up because of economic pressure. Um, I mean, not to mention everything else, like uh, uh, economic hardship is actually very good for totalitarianism. It makes people preoccupied and anxious and they don't, think about politics, they think about how they're going to feed their children, right? So, um, so, so it's a fantasy, but it's also, it's a very cruel fantasy. It's cruel to, toward ordinary Russians. Mm 
Um, but then there's the other extreme, <clears throat> which is this um, idea that uh, after Putin, somebody even worse may come, come along. And I'm not saying that that's not true, but what I'm saying is that the regime that's so dangerous, not just to Russians, but now we see to the entire world, is Putinism. Right? Um, there's no one else waiting in the wings, as despicable as some of those people are, for whom this is personal. Mm -hmm. There's no one else whose war it is. It's Putin's war, right? In this sense, it's not Russia's war. It's Putin's war. And the U.S. has historically made this mistake over and over again. The U.S. was afraid, uh, if you read uh, Joshua Rubinstein's terrific book, um, Last Days of Stalin, he looks at how Eisenhower's advisors were telling him that someone after Stalin, someone even more uh, hardcore uh, might, might come along, so they should prop up Stalin. And because of that, because of not realizing that all bets were off after Stalin died, the U.S. missed a lot of strategic and, and policy opportunities, like the opportunity to end the Korean War early, much earlier mm -hmm. uh, than it ended. And um, the U.S. really tried to prop up the Soviet Union for fear of a violent collapse and for fear of a hardline regime. Also, I think, in retrospect, a huge mistake. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the, the, uh, we ju should just be really weary of this idea that someone worse than Putin can come along. I'm not saying that it's not uh, that it's impossible, but I'm saying that there are huge opportunities for when Putinism ends. So, and, and I want to actually, I don't know if we have mics, but I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience at some point. But I want to ask you another question. You talked about, um, you know, that this war is personal. Let's let's talk about personal relationships and Z. Um, you know, Z. We're very fearful. Except, I think we also need to be realistic about China in the sense of a, a security. They have one security arrangement, which is with North Korea, and they don't actually like North Korea that much. Um, and then second, and we have 59. Um, they only have one or two overseas bases, and we have hundreds that are welcomed by many countries. Are we overplaying China, but are we underplaying the relationship between Xi and Putin? Because as I understand it, Xi's not a sort of huggy guy, but, but is very close to Putin and says that he really appreciates him. Um, is that a danger for us? Because is that a China adopting Putinism? I, you know, I'm not, it's not really my area of expertise. So, um, so I'm, I'm afraid I don't, you know, I, I may be off base here. I think that um, at this point, China is probably uh, the, the greatest obstacle on the way to Putin using nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that China certainly sees Russia not as an ally, but as as an opportunity, as a um, as very much a junior partner, a, a weak partner. Uh, and you know, if anybody can play Putin, it's Xi. So um, yeah, with, uh, I mean, it's always it's always a very dangerous game to to try to hope for that a bad actor will um, will moderate a worse actor. But I think that may be what we're looking at. Yeah. Let me open it up for questions for the audience. Oh. Yeah. We have a few minutes. Hi. Hi. Uh, Trooper Sanders. Um, so you spoke about this global reactionary axis uniting the, the far right in a number of regions. How does one organize the opposite? So, you know, there are disparate groups who are under threat, be it people of color in the U.S., Ukraine, LGBT globally, et cetera. What's the opposite side of that to organize the, the reaction to that? Yeah. No, that's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, we, we have to figure out ways to confront this past-oriented politics with future-oriented politics and not just with defensive politics, right? Um, I think... You know, we've certainly seen times in history when progressive visionary politics could sweep people along and sort of say, you know, you want to wake up in a different country in five or ten years that makes you feel happy about living in this place with these people at this time, right? I don't think we've heard that kind of political message 
from anybody in a long, long time, right? We tend to see a lot of technocratic rhetoric on the left and and a lot of ideological uh, and sort of romantic but nostalgic rhetoric on the right that's about the past, but we need to be seeing that about the future. So, oh yeah. with Fuller Project, which is an investigative newsroom focused on women. I wanted to thank you, Masha, for your really vital work and also longtime defense of journalism, freedom of the press, freedom of expression. Can you give us a bit of insight as to journalism in and around Russia today, what people are facing, and if there are any forms of support that have been useful to journalists trying to get the stories out of Russia? All right. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think it's impossible to overestimate just how restrictive the information regime has become. Um, in terms of how many foreign correspondents there are in Russia now, I mean, here we are both with these Evan buttons. Um, we haven't seen anything like this actually ever, mm -hmm. right? A, an American journalist jailed on espionage charges uh, and sort of any, a lack of any kind of community or cooperation on the ground among foreign correspondents uh, or between foreign correspondents and their sources. I mean, in that sort of level of risk, never, not even during Stalinist times, never, right? Mm -hmm. um, that creates a chilling effect, uh, unlike you know, anything we've seen. Uh, under Stalin, there was direct censorship. But you know, direct censorship is a little bit more like tyranny. You know what you get. Whereas uh, this is terror. Um, so, uh, so I think that puts us in a very difficult position of not being able to even fully trust what foreign correspondents on the ground can report. There's no substitute for being on the ground, but on the ground, you're at huge risk. So that's as far as foreign correspondents are concerned. Russians. Um, Essentially, all independent Russian media, such as there, uh, as there were, um, had to leave the country within the first week of the full-scale invasion. So now it's been over a year. They've been able to do absolutely extraordinary work, yeah. right? And this is we've seen this not just among Russian journalists. We've seen this among journalists from China, journalists from, uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, the rise of journalism in exile. Right? We hadn't seen this before. There's never been a te mm -hmm. the technology uh, to both report things from your pl the place that you're in exile from and for an audience that's back there. Right? It's, it's really a new era in, in, in journalism. And you know, uh, Russian journalists and exile outlets such as iStories, such as TV Rain, um, such Gosh. as Insider, yeah. have been able to do things that we will see, um, you know, we will appreciate their, their full importance, I think, in a few years. But for example, they've gotten Russian active military personnel to confess to war crimes on camera while reporting right. from abroad, right? It's amazing what they've been able to do. Um, what allows them to survive is the, uh, that they, um, they got a bunch of emergency grants mm -hmm. when they first left the country. And those grants are not going to last forever. Uh, I started a project a, a little over a year ago that's a joint Pan America Bard College project um, called the Russian Independent Media uh, Archive, where we're safeguarding all of their, uh, their archives of these independent media based on the rather tragic prediction that they're gonna run out of money, they're gonna stop paying for storage, we think the internet is forever, but it's not. It gets deleted. So we've created a usable, searchable archive of independent media and we keep adding to it. It's going to be this incredible thing, but it's also a toolkit for other countries mm -hmm. to use. But, um, but you know, we don't want to, to come to that. We don't want that to become the only source. We actually want places like TV Rain, Insider, iStories and others to survive and to be able to continue doing this extraordinary work. And it does show that a lot of people in Russia are looking at, like our mutual friend, Jenya Albats, right. who does a YouTube show every week. And um, a lot of Russians will see it. 
um, on through a VPN. And I would also encourage everybody to look at the see the documentary which won the Academy Award this year of Navalny and the group Bellingcat, which is an amazing yeah. investigative journalism group that does uh, that does really great work. Um, yeah. um, but but going to our just that may, reminded me of our own journalism in the United States. How troubled are you? Uh, about the state of journalism. And really, I think also not just, you know, partisan, but also the economic models, because we're just seeing, um, I mean, I grew up in the salad days of journalism, I think, where it was not a profit center. And unfortunately, right. we have now monetized information. Most people get their news, especially internationally, from, from social media, from Facebook. And we know that the algorithms actually monetize fear and hate, which deprioritizes facts and rational argument. How, how worried are you and what can be done to the information sort of system? I'm super worried. And, um, you know, I think that we didn't draw nearly enough lessons from the Trump presidency. Um, we should have understood in terms of media that we just weren't, you know, we're not ready to deal with bad actors. We have a huge normalization bias um, in all media. We also have, you know, the profit incentive uh, sort of corrupts things so deeply and we take it so for granted. Uh, you know, I used to t teach this class every year um, on sort of media criticism uh, class on covering politics and, um, and halfway through the semester after my students had read all this, uh, all, the, all the critiques that I thought were necessary of, uh, of the way media are structured in this country, I would say, so, you know, let's talk about how it could be done differently. Can we imagine news media as a public utility? Mm. And all my students who identified as super left would say, no, 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 we can't do that. The government, there will be government censorship. I'm like, really, like, why do you trust Mark Zuckerberg uh, or, you know, now Elon Musk more then you trust elected officials and structures that we could actually have a say in designing for maintaining editorial independence. Um, but you know, it was always it, it it always happened the same way. Halfway through this semester, you know, these 19, 20, 21 year olds uh, who identify as progressive, who lack the vision to imagine that we could have. Uh, public media here, or, you know, or think of media as a public utility, and you know, then I would say, you know, think of um, think of water as a public utility, right? Like, when we're not totally safe, as we know from from drinking poison water, but at least there's no there's no you know we we try to regulate it, and um, and we try hope that there's no po profit incentive for giving people poison water. But there's actually almost literally profit incentive for giving people poison water in, in, in the media. Um, but you know, unless we really change the conversation, unless, unless we really start to question the profit corporate uh, model of media making, we're just going to get into deeper and deeper trouble. So um, I was with, um, so in terms of fact checking, and this will be final question, um, you, um, I was I was actually at a, a dinner with uh, Christian Amanpour, who's here for her son Darius's graduation, um, and um, and she was talking about you know how to cover how to cover Donald Trump. Right. I think even how to cover just about anyone is pertinent, and the fact that you know covering the war in Sarajevo or covering the war in Chechnya and others, you know there is no kind of balance. Right. In some of these wars, and um, and so likewise in a political battle, do you believe there's that it can't be? Well, this one said and that one said, and that there, you know, um, Jeff Zucker at CNN apologized for covering the Trump rallies from end to end um, exclusively and said it would never happen again. Do you think that the press here needs to cover politicians differently? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think the press needs to cover politicians differently. I think there, uh, I mean, you know, there are like all these sort of standard critiques that we have, but they're, they're not, 
they're not wrong because they're standard, but you know, horse race coverage, uh, this, uh, this almost automatic way in which um, instead of looking at policy uh, the way that I think we should look at it, which is how does it affect people, we look at policy uh, almost exclusively in terms of how it affects the future of this party or, or that yeah, politician, right? Um, what would happen if we if we stopped doing that? And that's you know, uh, and and that's just sort of routine between elections coverage, right? right. Um, even that is almost if 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 you look at the way the Times, and I'm not you know I always single out single out the Times, not because the Times is particularly horrible, uh, but because the Times is so dominant at this point and sets so much of the tone for, um, for how we, we cover politics. Um, you know, but, but, but this, this idea that everything is formed and in, 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 is, uh, is framed in terms of strategic advantages and party politics and individual politicians' politics instead of what, what happens to people, I think that's number one. Uh, number two, you know, that automatically would, if we actually really truly try to think of journalism as a civic enterprise, uh, it would automatically change our coverage of elections mm -hmm. themselves. Referencing who we were just talking to, a public yeah. utility, yeah. Exactly. Um, and then, um, you know, we do have to draw lessons from the Trump presidency and from how, from the problems that the Times, again, faced one covering the Trump presidency, right? Um, I think I, I'm lucky enough to work at The New Yorker, which sort of went into this emergency mode during the Trump presidency and changed this tone. But it's a much more agile publication, and it doesn't have to, um, it doesn't have to cover the news as it breaks. Whereas The Times really found itself in this vice of having to cover the news uh, as though every day were a regular day, when no day was a regular day, right? Um, and so constantly using language that betrayed the nature of things, right? Like when, when, when Trump wrote an unhinged letter to the North Korean leader and, um, and words that were used were the words from vocabulary that's normally used to cover diplomacy. Right, that frames it, uh, that normalizes Trump. Right, and that's just one example, but it happened every day. What can we do? What kinds of what 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 kinds of vocabulary can we use? How do we cover abnormal things intentionally, so that they seem as abnormal as they ought to be? Um, and this is really really hard for journalists to think about because we're not used to thinking of ourselves as political actors, but we are. Thank you so very much Thank for you. joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>